Thank you again for joining us at the Purdue Extension Fruit Management Webinar Series hosted and presented by uh, Purdue Extension and the Indiana Hort Conference and Expo. Uh, today we will be offering those credits, so make sure that we have your information and attendance is recorded for that. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Long um, to talk about the cicadas and spotted lanternflies. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Karen. And thanks everyone for joining today. I'm excited to be in the second series of this webinar um, focused webinar series focused on fruit management. I'm going to share my screen here. And let me also make sure that I share my sound because I have a video. Okay, so one last thing here. I want to make sure I have a laser pointer. So hopefully everyone can see that and you can hear me okay. Looks good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, well, I am excited to, to be um, talking with you all today, um, remotely, unfortunately, but one day I suspect we'll be back together uh, in the orchards talking about all kinds of things. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today are periodical cicadas, of course, because they're emerging this year in Indiana and, and several other states. So that's what I'm going to focus on for the most, uh, the majority of the time today. And then I also want to talk about spotted lanternfly, which is an insect many of you probably know about. It's invasive, not detected in Indiana yet, but something I want to, want to put on your radar. So just an overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, periodical cicadas, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on that, specifically brood X. Um, which will be emerging this year. Um, many of you are probably familiar with periodical cicadas, but I'm just gonna briefly uh, go over the life cycle and then focus on damage and management in orchards particularly, because I'm, I'm sure many of you are growing various kinds of uh, tree fruits. And uh, this may be an, an issue of, of excitement for some, but also maybe a little anxiety for others. And then I'll wrap up the, the last part of the talk, again, focused on spotted lanternfly. I'm gonna really emphasize um, how to identify this insect and how to report. Um, sightings of this insect if you see something that you think it is uh, or not. We still want to know. So really em emphasizing preventative measures and identification so we can be aware and ready when this insect comes, but hopefully it won't be for several years. Okay, so I have one question to kind of get started, and this is going to help me shape maybe my level of energy and excitement about this insect. Um, how are you feeling about the 2021 periodical cicada emergence? And so this will kind of help me get a sense for um, maybe how excited I should be as I go through these, uh, these different parts of the talk. So I'll give everyone a couple of minutes here to answer. Are you feeling concerned, excited, a mixture of both? All right, so we had 36 participate in the poll, and it looks like most of our, most everybody's feeling a little of both. <laughs> okay, good to know, good to know. That's, that's good for me. I can focus on the, the good and the bad. Okay. Uh-oh, it's not letting me go to the next slide. What is happening? Here we go. Okay. Make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. So, periodical cicadas. Uh, there are several species of them. Uh, they're in this genus Magicicada, which is kind of a funny name because they do seem to have this magical kind of life history. Uh, many of you, your family members or folks you know, may refer to these uh, cicadas as 17-year or 13-year locusts. Um, as an insect person, I have to say they're not locusts, but uh, they have that kind of same mass emergence and plague-like uh, vibe that uh, people may think about from um, locusts in, in the past and actually in, in certain parts of the world still. But there are six known species of periodical cicadas. Five of those have been reported in Indiana. And brood X, um, or brood 10, is the one I'll be focused on today. And um, interestingly, this is also the largest uh, brood of the 17-year periodical cicadas. So here's a map of um, the brood X emergence and, and the other broods as well. But focusing on yellow here, these are all the, the brood 10, or brood X, that are going to be emerging in 2021. So you can see in Indiana, they're going to be uh, throughout the state. Most of us are going to see these, these periodical cicadas emerging. And if you were to count all the states here that have a yellow dot or square somewhere, there's about 15 states um, that we're expecting the, the brood X to emerge um, in 2021. So focusing specifically then on the 17-year cicada, which is again the one we're going to see, this is Magis Cicada Septum Decim, which is, makes sense, 17 years in the, in the name there. Um, again, these are going to emerge in 15 states. 
this brood last emerged um, in 2004, and, and some of you may remember seeing these insects uh, 17 years ago. Um, the emergence in Indiana typically occurs late May through June. Um, there's going to be some variability with weather, but that's typically what we see. And I just want to emphasize um, for those of you who are maybe a little less excited about these insects or creeped out that the good news is they do not bite or sting people. And this is a picture I took of a periodical cicada on my arm um, back in 2016 when I lived in Ohio. So interesting insects, and we'll talk a little bit more about their, um, their life history. So I'm going to play this video if it will let me. Um, uh oh, having some issues here. I may have to escape. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hopefully you're able to hear the sound. Okay, I see thumbs up. Thank you. So this was back in 2004. This is just about a minute and a half video, so I'm going to let it play. So a sound we all know well, maybe one that drives us crazy. <laughs> So what we're seeing here is some emergence holes. Here's an adult uh, that has died. This is the cast exoskeleton of a nymph. The finger for scale here. Is the male calling? Oops, it's all off. So here's a female laying eggs into a, um, a branch. This is her ovipositor here that kind of black stick looking tool and she's pushing that cutting it into the wood to lay her eggs and this of course is the damage that we'll talk more about another image of her laying her eggs here and if you get a close-up of those eggs in a damaged uh, stem this is what they look like see here this is the kind of characteristic damage of cicada egg laying in a, in a twig or branch. And this damage causes the symptom, um, symptomatic flagging of uh, branch tips. Um, yeah, and here's a really a nice image in a large oak tree. Um, these branches just break and turn brown and die. Okay, so let me just get my pointer back here. That's a, a very quick video, a real life action of, of what I'm going to be showing you a little bit more about um, in the remainder of the talk. So focusing in on the, the biology and what these insects uh, look like and do. Um, these are the adults. They're one and a half to two inches long. They're um, hard bodied insects. I can say when they emerged, uh, the last time I was in an emergence, I was riding a bicycle and they were flying and hitting me and they hurt because <laughs> they're pretty hard and large. They have this black body these reddish uh, colored eyes, legs, and wings. And their wings are transparent, so you can kind of think about their wing margins being more the orange or reddish color rather than the entire wing itself. And uh, as with many insects, uh, the shrill songs, I'm calling it a song, some of you may think it's a really horrible noise, um, they're produced only by males. And an interesting little tidbit here, this, uh, this song is actually created by these specialized organs called timbals and the first abdominal segment underneath the cicada. So they have um, these organs that their muscles rapidly vibrate them and that's what creates that singing kind of sound. And if you hold a cicada um, in your hand, you can actually feel that vibration. And again, I just want to emphasize they do not bite or sting. So just going a little bit um, through some images from my own experience and uh, again, kind of following up on that video, um, come uh, May slash June, late May or June, we'll start to see um, the nymphs emerge from the ground and you'll see these big holes emerging, maybe with signs of the exoskeletons around. The nymphs crawl up onto tree trunks and I say et cetera here, but this could be other things, a grill you have outside, um, buildings, anything you have outside that they can crawl up on uh, and they'll kind of um, rest there and they'll undergo their final molt. So they will emerge, um, kind of looks like the back of the shell kind of splits and then they'll fall out backwards um, and begin to develop. And, and they're crawling up onto these items to really help uh, to use gravity to help uh, move their wings or get the fluids in their wings to expand, much the way butterflies do. So once they've emerged, here's a newly, uh, a new adult 
You'll notice they're kind of pale, and this is just because their, their tissues have not hardened or sclerotized yet. Um, I've had some folks ask me, I saw this white cicada, is it a new species? But it's just a, a newborn or a newly emerged adult. Um, so despite this white color, um, when they first emerge, they're going to turn darker. But the key thing is they now have wings, and this is how you know it's the mature adult cicada. Um, after they emerge and, and sclerotize or harden up, the males will begin singing to attract a mate, and males and females live about one month. So just another um, example of a picture uh, of that egg laying. You saw that nice video showing the female kind of cutting into the wood um, and laying her eggs. Um, this is the damage that we'll talk more about. But after these eggs are deposited, they'll hatch in roughly six to seven weeks. And very, very small nymphs will emerge. In fact, I've never seen one, so we're hoping to catch some this year so I can see them up close and personal. But after hatching, those first uh, instar, or the kind of earliest stage nymphs, will drop to the ground. They'll dig down into the soil, and they'll begin feeding on um, the sap from tree roots. And that's what they'll be doing for the next 17 years uh, until they emerge again. So just another close-up image of that um, typical kind of damage you can expect to see um, on tree tree, twigs, and branches. Oh, and another close-up of the eggs, which is crazy and amazing. I should also add, once these eggs hatch, if you look in the slits that the females deposit, these eggs won't be hard, but you can still see the shell of the egg there. So kind of an interesting little thing if you're interested in looking more closely after the emergence this year. So some of you may be wondering, you know, why all at once? You know, this is one, I guess what makes the periodical cicada emergence such a natural wonder, but also kind of a, a problem, right, or a plague, if you will. And this is really a strategy on behalf of the insect to satiate their predators, right? So if they all emerge at once after 17 years, a lot of them are going to be eaten, but way more of them are going to survive to mate, lay eggs, and um, repeat this process 17 years later, or 13 years later, because they're also 13-year cicadas. So this is a nice diagram of um, the periodical cicada's life cycle. Um, I've, I've gone over most of this, so I won't uh, dwell on it, but I just thought it shows a nice diagram. The main things here, that there are um, one, two, three, four, and five instars, and these are the nymphal stages, and this is what's happening underground over that 17, um, 13 or 17 year cycle. And somewhere in the third or th second or third instar, the nymphs actually will attach themselves to tree roots. And um, that's how, and, and use their piercing sucking mouth parts to suck the sap. And that's how they're surviving all this time. And then as the time grows closer, um, they'll, they'll develop these emerging um, emergence burrows, emerge out, crawl up as we saw in that picture, molt. They now have wings, they'll fly around, mate, deposit their eggs, and then that process will continue. So I have another interactive question for you. Um, which of these is a periodical cicada based on what we've seen, what we've talked about? All right, looks like we kind of stalled out at 36 participants. So we'll go ahead and end the polling um, and share the results. It looks like everybody picked C, except just a couple Awesome, people. okay, well, you're all experts. And for those of you who selected A, um, you're not wrong entirely, this is a cicada. Um, and the reason I add this photo um, is because this is a dog day cicada. Um, you can see it's, well, it's kind of hard because the scale is not adjusted for these images, but it's more of a green color. They're actually a, quite a bit larger um, than the periodical cicadas. But this is a cicada that we have emerging um, every summer, kind of off and on. And so even in the summers where we don't have a periodical cicada emergence, you may hear them singing, and it's these dog day cicadas that you're hearing. So... It's still a cicada. You're still a budding entomologist. <laughs> and uh, we had a couple questions in the chat regarding this. So, does brood uh, ten have any other species associated with it besides um, the M. septentrium? Or and then then it was a couple follow-ups of yes, there's a couple more, but maybe you could elaborate on that. Sure. Okay. So the brood X that will be emerging, those are just the 17-year cicada species, so the magic cicada, septum decim, um, just that species exclusively. And I do have a table um, later on in the talk that lists the 13-year um, brews, although I don't have their species names on there. But we'll talk more about the, the other species, or at least the other 13-year uh, species that will be emerging. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so before moving on, I'll just mention um, 
This, this insect in the middle is a cicada killer, one that many of you are familiar with. It kind of looks like a, a scary, aggressive uh, wasp. You'll likely see a lot of these this year, catching these cicadas out of the air, dragging them into a, a burrow um, in the ground to lay their eggs and cover it up to leave their nymphs to, um, or the immature larvae to eat these cicadas uh, that they burrow, bury underground or bury underground. So just pointing that out, these are not really, um, these are not aggressive to people, nothing you need to worry about. If you see them, um, a lot of them this year, it's just because they're taking advantage of the bounty of cicadas, which are one of their key um, prey items because this is a cicada killer. Okay. Now let's talk about damage because I'm sure this is what many of you are joining this webinar to learn about today. So this is a picture that you saw from that video um, of the, the kind of characteristic damage of trees. But again, the females, they go to, to, to trees, to um, the twigs and branches to lay their eggs. And the physical act of her cutting into the wood, um, of course, creates an, a wound or physical damage, but it also weakens the branches. And so these infested branches, or she's laid eggs, can, they turn brown, they can die and sometimes break off. And that's what we call flagging. And that's what you see in this picture here. Um, and it's a big concern, of course, this year, um, particularly in regions that are gonna have heavy, heavy uh, densities of these cicadas because under heavy attack, um, the loss of these branches, particularly for young trees, can cause serious damage and even death. And there's also some anecdotal um, information um, that the nymphs, you know, if you have, for example, a tree like this, the nymphs falling out of this tree into the ground, um, they're going to be feeding on the roots for the next 17 years. There's some anecdotal evidence that that can reduce the vigor of trees, uh, probably more likely for younger trees. But um, again, you'd have to have a lot of these nymphs dropping out of the tree into the soil. So I just mentioned that because there's a little bit of information out there, but it's not really um, been or, or tested uh, or evaluated experimentally. But there, there is that chance that these nymphs may be um, capable of reducing plant vigor by feeding on the roots and removing nutrients. So which fruit trees are at greatest risk? So young trees, emphasis on young trees, these are the ones that are most vulnerable. The ones that have uh, branches and stems that are between 3 16 of an inch and 3 8 of an inch in diameter. This is the range, um, the size range of the stems that the females will lay eggs in. Things that are bigger, she's not interested in. Things that are smaller, she's also not interested in. But of course, this is a range that many, especially young fruit trees, um, this covers the range of, of the diameter of their stems and branches. I'm emphasizing fruit trees for this talk, but um, just so you all know, these periodical cicadas are, are not picky um, when it comes to where they're gonna lay their eggs. They're, they're reported to lay their eggs in more than 200 woody tree species, but for those fruit growers in the audience, I'm gonna emphasize apples, cherries, peaches, plums, and grape at highest risk. And this is because they seem to be preferred. So how can we manage uh, periodical cicadas and reduce the likelihood of damage? Um, for those of you who had advance notice or knew because you lived in the area that they'd be coming this year, um, you're probably set. Um, for those of you who maybe have purchased uh, new, new trees, to plant, please delay those plantings um, in, in 2021 until next spring, or at least until after the period when the, the cicadas have emerged and laid their eggs. This is a, a great uh, strategy for those of you who haven't, um, who are planting an orchard, because this is a cultural control option that's gonna just remove, um, remove the vulnerable, the, the vulnerable plants will not be able to be um, attacked by the females because they're just not there. And the next uh, strategy is to plan accordingly for the future emergence of periodical cicadas. And that's where I'm going to show this table here. I know this font isn't super, um, super visible. It's a little bit small here. I just squeeze it on. But just in terms of future planning here, um, I'm showing you where, when and where the 17 and 13 year cicadas are going to appear in Indiana. So of course, in this year, we're focused on brood X. This is a 17 year species. Um, and all counties are going to be hit. You probably remember from that map with all the yellow in Indiana but likely the heaviest hit counties are gonna be the ones in South Central Indiana. Um, the other uh, years I would emphasize are 2023, 2024, and 2025. You can see these a few tables here um, highlight when these next emergences will happen as well as the key counties that are likely to be affected. So this is actually an excerpt from a periodical, a periodical cicada bulletin that we um, have prepared and provided um, 
or that's available on the Purdue Entomology Extension webpage. Um, the, here is a copy of the link. If you were to click this, it would take you right to this page with more information, including uh, much of the stuff that I'm covering today. So just be prepared um, as you're putting in new orchards or maybe replacing um, old trees or, or just starting new, new things, be prepared, uh, particularly for the next several years <laughs> for these cicadas to emerge. The next strategy besides cultural control um, that works really well uh, in terms of protecting your trees against periodical cicada is mechanical control. And I have here uh, small orchards, backyard, fruit trees, and organic systems. Um, I wanna emphasize these because this is a great way um, or the best option for folks that fall into this category. You can net the trees. And this is gonna be with a mesh screening. There's lots of options out there. Um, different colors as well. You just want to make sure that the screening is no larger than three-eighths of an inch so that the cicadas can't crawl through it. You'll want to place the netting on trees, particularly the young trees, um, because they're the most vulnerable, when you first begin to hear the males singing. And that's because that's going to give you a window of time before egg laying begins. So I have a picture on the next slide, but in terms of putting this netting on, um, you may see different pictures online, but the way to best exclude these cicadas is to cover the tree with the netting entirely and tie the netting to the trunk right below the lower branches. Um, and this will keep them from crawling under it if you attach it to the ground or something like that. Attach it firmly right at the base um, below the lower branches, or I guess on the trunk below the lower branches. And then of course, remove that, that netting after adult activity ends. The next best strategy, um, and this is going to really come into play after egg laying has occurred is to prune. And so by pruning, um, you can go in and prune the stems or branches that females have laid eggs in. And this is um, whether the wood is just damaged or she's actually laid eggs. Um, and then you have branches that are infested. You want to go in and prune those um, so that they won't have a, a negative impact on the plant. And you also can remove those infested branches from from your orchard. So here I have removed pruned infested branches, um, pruned, but also infested. So I guess I should have put a comma there. And you wanna do this within four to six weeks after that egg laying, because if you prune them and just leave them on the ground and never pick them up, the eggs will hatch and they can potentially come out of there and just burrow right into the ground under your, your fruit trees. And you really don't want them there, especially if you're in an area where you have mass emergence. You don't want all those nymphs burrowing into the ground to feed on the roots of your, um, particularly your young developing fruit trees. So these are the really um, two best strategies, uh, particularly again for small orchards, backyard, folks with backyard trees, um, and also organic systems. I do realize this is um, labor intensive, but it, it, it is the most cost effective. So here's a nice example of a tree that's been covered with netting to exclude periodical cicada. So actually this tie down here looks a little bit loose, but um, just make sure you get that sealed off uh, really well and you're gonna have a nice protect, protected tree from the cicadas, from the females looking to lay their eggs. Um, I'll mention biological control because I suspect some are interested in the audience. Um, you can imagine that cicadas like many insects have lots of natural enemies, including birds and rodents. Uh, I'm a little bit excited this year because maybe the, the chipmunks will be feeding on the cicadas instead of the seeds in our bird feeder <laughs> this year. Um, unfortunately, these natural enemies that occur um, in and around the environments where these cicadas are going to be emerging are unlikely to actually dampen um, the size uh, or dampen the populations or reduce the damage caused by these cicadas simply because there's going to be so many cicadas emerging, um, there's going to be no stopping them. But just so you know, other, in other uh, insects and animals in are going to be feasting. The last management strategy I want to mention is chemical control, and this is really going to um, be important, particularly for those of you who have large uh, orchards or commercial orchards. And um, I do want to say that chemical control is a little bit controversial, um, and, and I'll explain a little bit more why um, as I go through this slide, but chemical control is, is not going to be as effective as netting. It's also not going to be um, as cost effective as netting, particularly if, if you're spraying um, expensive insecticides. And this is because netting excludes them physically. They can't get in as long as you have that netting in place. The chemical control, obviously, you're going to have to go back and spray repeatedly um, to knock back the waves of these adults as they're emerging over this period of one month. But for those of you who have no other um, economical option, 
um, chemical control can be a good tool. And so I just want to emphasize here that if you are going to use insecticides, please do not use them on, on large trees. It's, it's really not worth your money. These large trees can take the damage um, from the cicadas. It's really the young trees you want to focus your protection on. I also want to mention that soil applied systemic insecticides, and these are the products that um, can dis dissolve in water. The plant will suck it up through the roots or absorb it, I should say, through the roots and move it through the plant. Um, those are not going to be effective against periodical cicadas. And the main reason is that those products take time to move up and reach a concentration that's high enough um, in the above ground uh, parts of the plant. So if you don't get the timing right, um, it's not going to be effective. And furthermore, the concentration I suspect that the females will be exposed to by egg laying are not going to be enough to stop her from, from laying those eggs. So instead, once egg laying begins, um, insecticide applications should be targeted at small trees. And there are two strategies um, in terms of applying these insecticides uh, to protect them from the cicadas. If you apply the products every three to four days, you can prevent injury. And um, you can imagine that this is, this is intensive spraying. Every three to four days you're going out there, you're wiping out these, the cicadas so that they can't put any, um, impose any injury on your plants. On the other hand, you can apply products every seven to 10 days and reduce injury. So again, this is where you will have to make the judgment call um, in, in your commercial orchard um, in terms of what you think the trees can, can handle. But I think it's important, or I wanna emphasize that if you are using these insecticides and whether you're spraying every three to four days or every seven to 10 days, please be sure you're going out there to scout the orchard every two to three days um, after a spray. And this is gonna allow you to evaluate, is this product working, right? Is it stopping the, the cicadas, is it knocking them back? If not, you're just going out there and you're spraying and, and you're wasting money and your time, of course. So in terms of uh, pesticides that can be used, I'm, I have some examples here for commercial growers and also home homeowners. Um, I'll just mention that the pyrethroids, um, if you look, look for options um, that are recommended, pyrethroids are gonna come to the top of the list. And this is because they have fast knockdown activity and they have good residual activity. So you can think of these as the same kind of, these are the same kind of insecticides that you're using in the can of wasp spray. So it knocks them down really quick, they fall down and it lasts. But um, there is a trade-off with these pyrethroids, particularly for commercial um, orchards. Use of these pyrethroids extensively can cause mite flare-ups later in the season. And this is because pyrethroids are a broad spectrum insecticide. They're knocking out not just the cicadas um, and other pest insects potentially at the time, but also the good guys or the beneficial insects, including beneficial mites, which are really important um, for managing uh, plant feeding mites or the pest mites that are common on fruit trees. So things like Bathroid, XL, Mustang Max, um, these are the active ingredients. These are very likely to cause mite flare-ups if you use them extensively. On the other hand, products like Danitol or Brigade, um, flare-ups are not, are not as likely, um, particularly if you, I guess I should read this exactly as it says, flare-ups are unlikely only if max rate is used. Actually, that's a little confusing. So what I mean here is flare-ups are less likely if you use Danitol and Brigade. Um, if you do use them, use them at the lower rate. And by using the lower rate, you're gonna have less, a less likelihood of, of flare-ups on, on your um, tree pest mites or the, the, the tree feeding mites. So just avoid the maximum rate. Um, commercial producers can use Asana XL. This is Espen Valorate. Um, against periodical cicadas. That this periodical cicadas are actually specifically on the label of Asana XL in apple, pear, and stone fruits, including cherry, peach, plum, but not, not for grapes. So grapes have some other options. And I just wanna mention here that these asterisks, these are for commercial, these are products that are exclusive to commercial growers because these are restricted use pesticides. So for homeowners, there are also some options available. Again, these are gonna be pyrethroids. Um, so you should be mindful of, of uh, mite outbreaks, but typically um, on smaller trees or backyard trees, these mite outbreaks are easier to manage. Um, so things like permethrin um, or products with active ingredients, permethrin, cyfluthrin or uh, zeta cypermethrin will work well. And so I just have a couple of images here. One product called um, bonide, it's made by bonide, it's um, eight insect control. This specifically has periodical cicadas on the label. Um, and also this Garden Tech 7 insect killer. 
Um, and I just have here, please, please read the labels of these products and confirm the active ingredients. And I say this because some of you may think seven, seven is carbaryl, that's a carbamate um, insecticide, but some of the trade names are tricky. So when you look at these products, make sure you look for the active ingredient, which um, if I blew this up a little bit more, you could see is down here on the label. And what you want to make sure is that it's something like cyfluthrin, zeta, zeta um, cypermethrin, or permethrin. Um, I know you all hopefully are reading the labels of these products. Um, that is the law, so that you use them properly and safely. In the case of um, bonide 8, I just have a note here that this should not be used after petal fall on apples. So those are the main options that are available to you all, um, homeowners and commercial producers um, who have tree fruit. And so just to summarize then the section on periodical cicadas, and then I'll, I'll um, open it up for a couple of questions before I move on. The 17-year cicada emergence, brood X, it's coming. Um, sometime late May through June, it's going to be heaviest in South Central Indiana. Again, the damage caused by these cicadas are, is mainly coming from the females as she cuts into the, the twigs and branches to lay her eggs. And it's particularly these branches um, in the size range of 3 16 to 3 8 of an inch in diameter that are vulnerable. If you have an orchard or backyard fruit trees that you want to protect, Prepare to take action when you hear the first males begin to sing. You don't want to wait until they're flying and then you're running out there trying to put the netting on. You uh, want to give yourself a little bit of notice or a little bit of time to get those, the netting in place. Focus your protective efforts, whether that's netting, um, pruning, your insecticide applications on young trees because these are the ones that are most vulnerable. You know, if you're in an area where the cicadas emerge, um, have a mass, mass emergence, or really heavy uh, pressure on your trees, they can kill these young trees. So um, those are the ones you should focus on protecting. And last but not least, select and use the insecticides judiciously um, to reduce flare-ups of secondary pests like mites. And I didn't mention some of the other secondary pests like aphids or scales. Mites are the key one, but again, use these products judiciously, read the labels, um, and hopefully you won't have any issues with secondary pests flaring up um, on your trees after the cicadas are, are done and gone. So I have a third poll question here, um, which is kind of a segue into um, my next slide, which will open up for some questions from, from the audience. Um, I'm curious to know how well this, this presentation increased your knowledge of the cultural, mechanical, and chemical management strategies for periodical cicadas and orchards. And even though it may be 17 years before I give this talk again, I want to make sure I, I hit the hit the nail on the head if I can. So I'm open to your feedback. So it looks like um, people are have definitely learned a lot from your presentations. So thank you. Hey, thanks everyone. Thanks for your honest answers. <laughs> just so you know, I can't tell who answers what. I just want to know it, how I can all help. All polls <laughs> today are anonymous. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Karen, for putting up that poll. Thanks everyone for responding, that's helpful for me. Um, my next slide, I'm just gonna open it up actually to those questions, if this will let me, there we go. So before I move in to talk about spotted lanternfly, which is very brief, I just thought I would open it up for a few questions from the audience. Um, Great, so um, if you have, I don't know if you have the chat open, but if you go back, um, so the first question uh, was, what is the best awareness of cicada emergence and decline? Um, so how do we, you know, plan for the mitigation of cicadas? Um, is it the 64 degree Fahrenheit soil that triggers their emergence? Is there a corresponding, you know, growing degree day, et cetera? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I do know that there's some information about soil temperature. It's not clear to me about how what depth that soil temperature is. So um, I'm not confident about that. Um, in terms of growing degree days, I'm not aware of a, of a calendar that we have um, for, cum for cumulative degree days, but I, would, I will certainly look into that. And we'll be putting out some newsletters and um, about periodical cicada here in the next, actually next week. So I'll make sure to include that information. And they'll be able to question. find that in the Fancy Fruit? Yes, in the Facts for Fancy Fruit. Great, and then the, the question kind of continued, um, you know, is there a time meter duration for Japanese beetles? Or is it similar, do you know? Um, I would say Japanese beetles are probably gonna come, well, I guess it depends on where you are in the state, right? The southern part of the state, 
I would roughly say you're going to be probably two weeks ahead of everyone else, temperature wise. Um, so things may be happening more quickly there. Um, in my experience, Japanese beetles tend to come out late June, early July, and they'll stick around for maybe a month sometimes. Well, there's that month window where they'll be really abundant and then you'll still see a few groups here and there. So I would say in terms of timing, um, they're going to be a little bit later than the um, emergence of the cicadas um, that we're expecting this year. And for, for those, I'm, I'm only knowledgeable about this in apple, but um, well, relative to the phenology of apple trees, that typically the, the periodical cicadas emerge around um, first, first and second cover um, in terms of, of a spray uh, calendar, spray management timeframe. Unfortunately, I don't know what that phenology, where that falls for like peaches and cherries, but if that, hopefully that's helpful. And so do they uh, also eat herbaceous plants like asparagus or small shrubs, for example? Great question. So they are going to be hitting woody plants. So small, like vegetable-like crops um, or yeah, green, I, don't, I was trying to think, I guess non-woody stuff, they're not going to be as, as interested no, in. <laughs> right. But like if you have, um, you know, container blueberries or, you know, woody shrubs like that and that are in that size category, they are absolutely fair game. Not so much the vegetables, though. And then uh, someone asked, does mycorrhizal fungi applications to the roots affect the nymphs? Hmm. cicadas that is a good question so i guess mm -hmm. i would follow up with mycorrhizae meaning like good mycorrhizae or bad like as a treatment or just in general um well it I says guess, as an application so i'm, I'm oh okay a beneficial mycorrhizal fungi that they can yeah i would have to look into that or or read up more on it i, I can think of other examples of they're not mycorrhizae but they're fungi um, that, are, that are applied to the soil to treat other insects, soil-dwelling insects, like right. Japanese beetle is one that comes to my mind. Um, but it's, it can work well, but it tends to take time for those, uh, the propagules of those fungi to build up to a level where they can start to kill the larvae that are, um, in this case, white grubs that are underground. And it's, depending on the size of your orchard, um, it can be very, very expensive. And so it's not necessarily something we would recommend for Japanese beetles. Um, and of course, in the case of the periodical cicadas, you know, they're already emerging. So the, the goal is really to hit the adults so that they can't do the damage. Um, do the nets, the tree nets, inhibit any of the pollinators? Yes, that is a great question. So the size of the screening um, definitely would exclude pollinators. Um, so depending on your trees, you know, what kind of tree fruits you have and when they're blooming, that is something to consider. And I guess, I was going to say, if it were me, we have like three backyard little apple trees. Um, we've pruned them really hard, so we're not going to get any fruit this year. <laughs> um, I would say that, you know, that's something you'll have to balance, you know, um, getting the fruit versus the risk of damage. So um, older trees or larger trees that are going to be flowering um, and that you can expect fruit from are probably, you know, the ones I would say um, leave those unnetted, they're, they're less likely to be damaged. But if you have young trees that are maybe flowering for the first time or, um, or just, yeah, in that size category, those are the ones that would be worth protecting, you know, potentially at the cost of excluding pollinators, but I, I shouldn't say. <laughs> right, it's going to be a, quite of a balancing act and with, with the weather warming up like it is, maybe there'll be some petal fall before those uh, cicadas are fully emerged. I don't know. So we'll have, yeah. it's going to be a lot of scouting and um, uh, just watching and listening, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, and we had one question that uh, one paper cited the use of surround um, as a deterrent. Uh, found that it was quite helpful in deterring Japanese beetles. Uh, however, given sheer volume of cicadas, uh, this may not provide adequate protection. Is there any suggestion on the use of surround in an orchard for cicadas? Mm, that's a good question. I know that product. I don't know what the active ingredient is off the top of my head. So it's the the kale and clay protection. Oh, okay. So. I'm not so familiar about the deterrent properties. The deterrents, so for example, I know pyrethroids have a deterrent 
um, element, which is one other reason they work well against the cicadas. I'm not sure how, how effective that is against um, the kaolin clay, um, the surrounds deterrence of insects. I, I, I don't know anything about that. I would have to, to read the label. Um, I would say though that, you know, it, it would be a balancing act in terms of, of effort and cost of putting those on all the trees and then the, the need to reapply. Um, so, and that, that's really where the insecticides become so expensive. And if, if the main concern is um, the females laying their eggs and the, and doing that damage, um, the clay is, I, I imagine is more of a deterrent on the chewing aspect or, you know, the Japanese beetles chewing on the leaves. So it may deter some feeding. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not very familiar with that product, okay. unfortunately. Sorry for the person who asked that question, but please, um, I have my email at the end so we can follow up. I, I suspect that the clay, I wonder if there's an element of contact that's required um, to, to kill the, the individuals or deter feeding. Um, so I'm just thinking of rather than going out and spraying that repeatedly and wondering what the efficacy would, would be, I think the most cost effective and safe, safe approach would be to net. Um, obviously that's a lot of work and also comes at a cost, but it's, you're gonna get your bang for your buck if you can exclude the females especially if you're in an area where they're just coming, you know, like in mass. Um, and another question says, during past emergences, uh, they've noticed that the application of Danitol seems to provide a degree of female repellency in the treated area. Uh, have you experienced this? What do you think? I have heard of this, um, that Danitol, it's another reason it, it's a product that works really well, um, to my knowledge, in, in fruit systems. Um, more so grape and apple than the others, but I know that there's also that repellence um, or deterrence element. And again, that's because it falls in that class of the pyrethroids. Very good. Um, and then uh, Sid had a question about what about pears? Is, if you wanted to elaborate, Sid, I'm not sure okay. what, the, what the question's referring to, but. Maybe we can get a follow up and I'll. Um... Yep. So if you want to just go on and move on ahead and then we okay. can um, said if you want to follow up on your question, please, we can get to it after the next portion. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for these questions. Um, sheesh, I should have looked into the degree day model thing, but I will do that and follow up in the facts for fancy fruit. So learning a lot from what, from what you all are asking uh, myself. Okay, so we've talked about the periodical cicadas. Um, at the risk of being negative, uh, I wanna also talk about spotted lanternfly, but really the emphasis here will be um, on tips for you to stay vigilant um, for this insect so that we are prepared when, I was gonna say if, but it's probably more likelihood of when it appears in Indiana. Thankfully it is not here yet. So for those of you who um, have not heard about the spotted lanternfly, this is what it looks like. Um, this insect was first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, it was a big deal um, and they put quarantines into place uh, to reduce or limit spread. Since that time, it's spread to 26 uh, counties in, in Pennsylvania where they're still undergoing, um, where they still have quarantine and management efforts in place and also five neighboring states. Most recently, a very, very Eastern side of, um, a very, very Eastern county in Ohio. So it, it's, you know, getting closer. Um, but not too close, but we still need to be ready. So this is a plant hopper. Um, so it's a good hopper, um, a, kind of an attractive insect. And a good thing is that not many other insects that we have in the area are gonna look like this. So this will be helpful or make it easier for you to identify this insect. Uh, we're concerned about the spotted lanternfly because it attacks several different plants. The main ones that are important um, to state economies like Ohio, Pennsylvania, here in Indiana are gonna be grapes, hops, the stone fruits, apples, and pines. And I'll say that there's been some updated, um, some updates from the Pennsylvania group that apples seem to be um, not as heavily damaged or um, not as a, not, originally they were really concerned about apples, but now it seems like grapes are the ones that are really getting hit by these spotted lantern flies that are most likely to be negatively affected. But research continues and will be changing as, uh, as we gain more information. So these, these insects, both adults and nymphs, have a piercing, sucking, feeding strategy. So they, they stab their mouth parts into the plant and they suck out plant juices. Um, 
the carbohydrates that they're that the plants need to of course grow and produce fruits and the speeding can cause wilting it can cause dieback and even death particularly of grapevines and um, for those who don't really grow fruits um, but might well in pennsylvania i should say ur in urban areas um, the spotter lantern flies a big pest to them because as they're feeding on trees they produce copious or excessive amounts of, of liquid waste which is called honeydew it's very sugary and um, sticky because it's basically the sugars out of the tree that they're not using and they just kick it out the back end it drops all over their patio furniture it's, it's sticky and gross so people really don't like that it's um really ruining the aesthetic uh, element of being outside in the time of year when they're feeding um and back you know to the actual um fruit trees themselves all this honeydew that drops down it, it's a perfect substrate for um for fungi to grow so you can get a lot of mold development on the surface of um, plant tissues below the area where these insects are feeding and so of course all that mold grows and you have even less photosynthesis occurring because the leaves um, leaf surfaces are blocked from getting sunlight so here's an image of um, of a grapevine infested with spotted lantern fly uh, this was taken in pennsylvania so you can see these insects are pretty large these are some grapes here but they're focused on feeding on the actual canes the plants themselves not so much on the fruits so just briefly the life cycle, and I, I illust or highlight this again, um, not because I expect you to remember all of this, but so you kind of have an idea of what these look like. So there are four nymphal stages. These are all wingless. So these cannot um, fly away if you were to see them. Um, they're pretty small uh, in the first nymphal stage, but they're black with these white spots. And as they get larger, um, they kind of have a stink bug appearance, but that they look quite different um, but maybe that's just me saying that because i've stared at a lot of insects so as they go from um, the first nymphal stage to the second to the third they're getting larger with each molt and then the fourth instar which is just before the adult they start to take on this red um, a postsomatic or warning color and these are very um, conspicuous they're very eye-catching and you can see here they have these wing pads um, on the on the late instar nymphs because eventually they will molt out into the adult that has these wings and um, of course in the adults will mate they lay their eggs um, under this this weird kind of hardened uh, covering i have some uh, real life images on the next few slides um, so what i what i hope you'll take away from this presentation is how to or know what to look for the nymphs um, in particular because there's not other nymphs that really look a lot like this um, i would say it's probably the third and fourth in stars that are most easily visible um, the adults, which are going to be very visible, and then the eggs, which are probably not something you're going to see unless you're really looking like they are in Pennsylvania. They're very um, well camouflaged, but still something you should be familiar with. So here are the um, actual insect specimens. Again, this is that first instar, second, third, fourth. Um, so here you can see again from the transition, they're getting bigger, those bright red colors. Not many other um, insects that look like this. Um, that you're going to see in the area. Um, the adult's about one inch long, and um, this is a pin specimen that's been dead, but here you can see its abdomen and then its wings are exposed. So it's the hind wings that have this reddish color and the four wings that have these spots that are, you know, kind of attractive, um, but very showy for sure. So in terms of how to identify this insect, uh, hopefully, again, we won't see it anytime soon. These pictures are all from Pennsylvania. Um, the adults, when they're on a plant, they, they're sitting with their wings held tent-like over their abdomen or over their body at rest. Um, when the wings are opened, as here, you're going to see this bright red coloring, um, which is not as apparent, obviously, when they're sitting with their wings closed. And you may actually see a behavior if you see a few of them and you disturb them or you poke them, um, they will flash their wings um, to kind of flash that red color as a warning. And so that's their strategy to scare predators like birds or other insects. They cannot hurt you. They can't bite you. They can't sting you. Um, I doubt they'll even hop on you. They'll probably just drop off or try to fly away. Um, though they're not very good flyers, but they are good jumpers. And that makes sense because they are plant hoppers. So this is just a picture of a tree that's been banded uh, to, to capture adults as they're crawling up uh, to find a place to feed. And this is something they're doing. They're investing a lot of, of time and effort in in Pennsylvania to stop the spread. Here are the pictures of the eggs that I mentioned. Um, this is that egg case that the female secretes over the eggs as a, as a protective covering. 
And then if you were to scrape that off, these are what the eggs look like underneath. So I've never seen these in real life. I'm willing to bet uh, money that they are very challenging to spot, especially when this covering is not in place. So I showed this to you just so you have these images and you'll have access to this uh, recorded presentation after. Um, but just wanted you to know what this looks like. Um, just for scale, um, here is somebody pointing to an egg mass on a rock. So I don't know about you, this is going to be pretty hard to ID um, unless you know what you're looking for and you're looking for it a lot. So needless to say, we are capable of, of developing a search image. Any of us can to know what to look for. But I, I share these pictures with you now really so that you have um, some level of awareness. And something else that's important about the females when they lay their eggs, um, these are going to show up in the late um, late fall, these um, egg casings, they're just as likely to lay them on um, the trunks of trees, woody stems, but also patio furniture or grills. And so this is one of the reasons that um, they've become, we, one of the reasons we think that they've spread as much as they have, because people just don't know that they're on the side of, you know, a vehicle or uh, on a piece of furniture, something you may have taken camping and bring back home. So that kind of brings us to some of the early tips for managing spotted lantern fly. And this is all based on work that's been, that continues to be done in Pennsylvania. I'm realizing I'm getting close to my time here, so I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. If you travel in and out of the quarantine zone, and that's those 26 or so counties in Pennsylvania, um, they recommend that you check your vehicle and any outdoor equipment. Again, grills, mowers, outdoor furniture for the nymphs or adults. Um, and these are going to be present year round but also the egg masses. And that's the one, again, that you're most likely to miss because they're very small and you just might not be looking for it. And again, these egg masses are gonna appear um, or gonna be out in the environment late fall to early spring. Another thing is, you know, please don't move firewood. And that's because we know from the quarantine zone, because we know the females will lay eggs on, on wooden trunks or, or solid kind of wooden items, objects, I should say. So, um, the other management strategy right now um, has to do with managing the tree of heaven. And I'll just briefly say here that this is a highly preferred tree by the spotted lantern fly. Um, these trees are very common, kind of a weedy tree that'll pop up in urban areas, woodland edges, roadsides, um, et cetera. So um, there's efforts being made to remove these um, so that they're not a resource to the, to the spotted lantern flies when they appear. So if you have, um, spotted, or I'm sorry, if you have these trees in your landscape, you can actually go out and use them as indicator trees. We might expect that they would appear on these trees before anything else um, because they're highly preferred. So if you have them, start checking them now. Others recommend you start removing these trees because they are weedy and you, I don't know, you probably are not, you didn't plant them probably. So this web or this link here has a lot of really nice information about managing spotted lanternfly in general, including how to ID the, the trees and, and removing um, removing them, different options for you. So the last thing I'll say here, um, and then I'll cut myself off, um, is to, if you remember nothing else from this talk um, about spotted lantern fly, please just remember this, to remain vigilant. So if you see an insect that you suspect is spotted lantern fly in Indiana, even if you're wrong, um, please take a picture, mark the location, and contact your local Purdue University Extension Office or the Indiana Department of Agriculture at this number here that I've highlighted in yellow. That's the number one thing. You can't be too cautious. If you see it, please report it. Even if you're wrong, we'll appreciate your effort. The second very important point is if you see something that looks like the insect or its eggs, please do not collect them and move them um, in an effort to get them to an extension agent or someone else um, because you're just likely to be enhancing the spread. So those are the two key things you can be doing right now uh, to protect all of us um, here in Indiana and, and other areas um, more west of us from the spotted lantern fly. So I've kind of moved through this already. Uh, I had a final poll. I don't know if we have time to go through this. Um, okay. So, okay, yeah, it, I'm, I'm interested to know if this presentation increased your confidence and in, in your ability to identify and report spotted lantern fly. We'll give a couple of minutes cutting into Steve's time here. Sorry. <laughs> we, we have a scheduled um, little sponsor break anyway at two o'clock, so we'll, we'll be all right. One question though, as people are answering that poll um, is, so the, the question regarding pears was that the pears wasn't mentioned um, with the cicadas as a preferred uh, plant. So that he was wondering about the Bartlett pears that he just planted. Oh, okay. Yes, I would still protect them. Absolutely. Yes. They're not preferred, but 
they will lay their eggs on anything in that size category they can get. And one last question um, is that about spotted lanternfly. So what distance do they travel from where they emerge? I believe that was the spotted lanternfly. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Um, they don't fly very well. Um, my understanding based on work in Pennsylvania is that they'll, they, they can move a farther distance. I'm trying to think of what that would be. Probably no more than 100 meters or so. Maybe that's even too much. 100 meters if they're assisted by the wind. And it seems to be that they found late in the season, um, and this is work that's been done in, in vineyards, that that time of year, that's when they're moving from wooded areas into vineyards. And it seems like when it's windy or a warm, windy day, for what that's worth, that really assists them in their movement. Otherwise, they're pretty limited in making a long um so they're going to be flying along the distance. They're brought, they're going to be brought to Indiana by people, not by their own. Right. Yes. That's <laughs> that's a good way to answer that question. <laughs> they're not like Japanese beetles or you know stink bugs, which, which can fly really well. Well, thank you um, for this very informative talk. And so everybody seems to agree uh, that they've learned quite a bit about the spotter and lantern fly, and hopefully we don't really need that knowledge for a few more years. Um, but if you have any further questions. Uh, for uh, Dr. Elizabeth Long, you can feel free to send her uh, email, and it looks like she's also on yes. Twitter. So thank you again for your um, talk, and if anybody has any further questions for her, you can feel free to put them in the chat um, or send her an email. So thank you again, and with yes. that, we'll take our few minutes sponsor break and start back up at 2.05 um, with Dr. Myers. Thank you. Thank you. For over 85 years, Norse Farms has produced and sold premium quality small fruit plants to national and international commercial fruit growers, home gardeners, and resellers. We're committed to providing customers with virus-indexed, highly productive plants. This commitment drives us to stay on the cutting edge of the latest developments in the industry. We identify and test new varieties and growing techniques so that we can stand behind our promise to deliver quality to you. From our on-site lab to our greenhouse, our fields to our packing house, our number one priority is to ensure that you get the best plants possible. For more information about Norse Farms, visit us at norsefarms.com. Whether you're an experienced grower or first timer, we're here to help you every step of the way. We look forward to growing with you. And we'll get moving on now with um, our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Myers with Purdue Extension and the Horticulture Department. And he will be talking with us today about uh, weed management and the in the fruits. So thank you, Stephen. Are you yes, there? Yes, I am. Uh, let's see. Get my presentation button here. All right. I guess we're looking good, right? All right. It looks good. Well, thank you for um, being here with us today, and we look forward to hearing what you have. Okay. We'll get so I think we've got a poll question maybe at the beginning here. Uh, we'll go ahead and get that going. But um, I think this is the second time I've talked to this group. I spoke last year when we were in person um, but didn't you know didn't get a chance to talk about integrated weed management so that is kind of where i'm going to go with today's presentation and since it's across a lot of perennial fruits it's going to be uh, kind of broad so we'll we'll see how it goes um here I gotta close well it looks like um so far <laughs> weeds is definitely concerned in the perennial fruit crops well, good. That's good news. I guess, first of all, one of the things I need to say, too, is a thank you to a number of the folks that, that contributed slides to this presentation. So their, their names are on the screen here as well. All right. So when I give an integrated weed management talk, usually the first thing that I want to emphasize is um, the question that weed scientists get a lot, which is what you see on the screen. What herbicide do you recommend for dot, dot, dot. And it's usually some no-win scenario where there's a really tall weed or really a huge amount of weeds in a crop and we don't have a herbicide that we can actually use. Um, so what I try to encourage people to do is to be proactive and not reactive with our weed management program, focus on prevention, even if it's just implementing the use of pre-emergence herbicides in addition to post-emergence products, and, and not to focus on cures, and then also consider integrated approaches. So we'll talk a little bit about herbicides, primarily updates to the, the, um, 
the production guide here later in the presentation, but most of the talk is going to not focus on herbicides. All right. In general, we say that weeds are bad because they compete with our crops for light water and nutrients. That's pretty well accepted. And the result of that competition is a reduction in yield, but also a reduction in quality. And when we talk about quality, a lot of times what we're talking about is something like fruit size. So smaller apples, smaller pears, smaller whatever your fruit is. But it can also have effects um, on the sensory aspects of the fruit as well. And we'll touch on some of that later. Weeds can also reduce harvesting efficiency, whether that's hand harvesting or mechanized harvesting. They can host plant pathogens. The example that comes to my mind most often when I think about this are um, weedy brambles on, the, on a field edge that can host pathogens that can be vectored from the weedy brambles into our cultivated brambles. So our, our blackberries and our raspberries. Um, when I gave a talk like this a month ago, one of the examples that uh, an apple farmer gave was apple cedar rust. So it uses cedar trees as an alternate host for that pathogen to complete its life cycle. So there's interactions between our crops and the surrounding weeds or plants around our fields as well. Um, another thing that can be bad about weeds in our production systems is, is that can be allergens. And what I tend to visualize when I think of this is um, poison ivy that's growing up the center of blueberry bushes, which I've seen several times. So if you have a U-pick or if you even have just laborers out there hand picking blueberries, you know, there's a chance that they could get that on their skin and get a rash from it. The other thing is that if you have a U-pick scenario or, or farm or something like this, weeds can be unattractive and they can be hazardous if they pose, for example, a tripping hazard or weeds with spines can, can poke your, your clients or your visitors. Now, most of the time, we have a really simple definition of weeds. Weeds are simply a plant out of place. Now, if you're a weed scientist, you have about two or three other working definitions of a weed, but we'll just focus on the most basic definition for this presentation. All right, the interesting thing in perennial fruit crops is determining where is out of place. At least for me, this is one of the interesting parts about perennial fruit crops and weed science. And so it's very possible that we draw a line in our field or our, our plots or our blocks or whatever we want to call them. Um, and the same plant that's growing on the left side of this yellow bar could be a weed. And if it's growing on the right side of this yellow bar, could not be a weed, even though it's the, the exact same plant. So uh, the interesting thing about perennial fruit crops is where we draw the line that defines out of place. And the way that we tend to think about this is through this term called orchard floor. So with perennial fruit crops, we have really two main zones of the orchard floor. The area that is uh, in, within that planted row, so so many feet on either side of the planted row that we try to maintain weed free with, often with herbicides. And then the row middle area that's either sodded or has some kind of native vegetation. And we use that for trend, you know, moving through the field. So spraying, picking, uh, pruning, all those kinds of operations. The width of the weed-free area that surrounds the planted row can be manipulated to control things like plant vigor, crop yield, fruit size, um, the amount of pruning that we have to do, and then also fruit quality as well. We'll touch on a couple examples of this. The reason that we can manipulate the weed-free area around our planted crop and see an impact is because that in general, weeds that are closer to our crop are more competitive for light, water, and nutrients. The example on the screen is from annual plastic culture strawberry, and that's vetch growing through the planting holes. So in this scenario, if the vetch were in the planting holes, that's, that's the worst case for us. If they were in the shoulders of the bed, that would be less worrisome than the planting hole. If they were in the row middles, that would be uh, less problematic than either the shoulder or the planting hole. So the proximity of the weed to the crop is really important. We're going to give you an example of this. So um, this is work done by Nick Basinger uh, and colleagues done in North Carolina, published in 2019. But they had five-year-old Navajo blackberries. So Navajo is one of these semi-erect, thornless, floricane-bearing blackberries. And they looked at several different uh, herbicide strip widths or weed free strip widths. So zero, two, three, four, and six foot. 
And they took yield data, information on the primocanes and fluoracanes, and also some fruit quality data as well. And we're gonna show you what the results look like. All right, so first, to give you a visualization of what each of these strip widths look like. This would be zero, so the, the row middle vegetation was allowed to grow right up into the planted row. Two foot, so one foot on either side of the planted row was maintained more or less weed free. Three foot, four foot, which is a typical grower recommended uh, strip width, four foot. Six foot, um, I guess that's, that's as wide as they went, six foot. Uh, in, in some of my previous work, we went to eight foot, but, but they, they just went to six foot. So what you can see here is prima cane number. So the number of first year canes essentially that are made. Um, and so the bottom is the vegetation free strip width. Now it's listed in meters, but we'll try to, to translate it here for you. Um, let me see if I can get my laser to work. Is it working? There we go. All right. So then on the Y axis here is prima cane number. So what you'll notice is that between zero and three foot, there's this increase in the number of primocanes that are made. And then we kind of plateau between three and six foot. All right, so the opposite is observed with primocane stem diameter. In this case, there's a decrease in stem diameter because we have more primocanes, each one's a little bit thinner. It kind of decreases between the zero and three foot width, and then kind of levels out between three and six foot. All right, so where the rubber meets the road here, looking at fruit yield. Now this is reported in number of blackberry fruit per plant. And so what you will see is here, really between zero and two foot, there's not much difference in, in the effective strip width on number of fruit per plant. However, when we increase from two foot to six foot, you know, it's almost a linear response here. And what's really interesting is that the recommended or typically used strip width of four foot, um, we actually see quite a bit of a bump in yield just by adding two more feet. So one foot on either side of the planted row. Now this, this is essentially the same curve because this is um, blackberry yield reported in kilograms per hectare. And a kilogram per hectare is essentially the same as a pound to the acre. So if it helps you to think of it as pounds to the acre. Uh, instead of kilograms per hectare. This, the trend is the same. Again, uh, zero to two, not, not much difference. When we go from two to six foot in that strip, we, we begin to see a dramatic increase in blackberry yield. Also greater blackberry yield at six foot than at four foot. Now the impact on fruit quality was also observed. So as, uh, in this case, as the strip width increased, the soluble solids concentration in those fruit increased as well. For the most part, from zero to three foot, pH remained unchanged, and then we see a drop off from three foot to four foot, and four foot to six foot. So pH is dropping there. All right, one thing to be mindful of, when I did this research, uh, a photo from some of my plot work is on the left side of the screen here. That would be a four foot strip width for, um, for newly planted Navajo, and on the right would be a four foot strip width for established Navajo. The other thing that you'll notice is these were done in two different parts of um, the state of North Carolina. So the left one was in the Sand Hill section where they can't grow fescue because it's too warm, and the right um, was in the, more of the Piedmont or the, the mountain kind of area, uh, so they can grow fescue. So you can see the row middle vegetation is far more lush on the photo on the right compared to the photo on the left. And that's something to be mindful of as well when we consider strip width. All right, we'll move on to some examples from tree fruit. So we're gonna use peach. So before uh, a colleague of mine did a, a similar study in peach, really the one publication that we would point to was this Glenn and Newell. And they reported a 30% increase in peach yield with an eight foot strip compared to a two foot strip. So I uh, had a colleague who kind of teased out what was going on um, between eight and two, or two and eight. But before that, um, there was this work done by Andrew McCray and colleagues and published in 2007. And what we'll show you here is they looked at how the effect of maintaining the herbicide strip weed-free for a certain number of weeks after flowering. So that is what is reported on this x-axis here. So this would be uh, zero weeks after flowering. So essentially, 
after the peach trees had flowered, weeds were allowed to grow into, uh, into the row. And then three foot or three weeks weed free, six weeks, nine, 12, and 15 weeks maintained weed free after peach flowering. And what you'll notice is that they report uh, an increase in fruit number up until about nine weeks after flowering, and then it levels off. But they, it, they report an increase in total yield uh, that kind of plateaus at around 12 weeks. So why is that important? So what's going on here is that cell division in those young fruit really go a long way into dictating fruit size. And so if we want to plot where that 12 week mark would be, it'd be about right here, kind of toward the end of the pit hardening stage. So by maintaining the plots weed free, especially during that cell division period, we're able to maximize fruit size, which goes a long way into maximizing yield of the crop. All right, now to give you an example of the effect of herbicide strip width or weed free strip width on peach, this work was done by Juliana Buckaloo and I had a, the, the pleasure of helping out with this um, when I was in graduate school. But so you can see her treatments included blocks of peaches that were irrigated or not irrigated. And then she had several strip widths as well. So that would be zero, two, four, eight, ten, 10, and 12 feet wide. Again, half of that on either side of the planted row. She used uh, contender peach planted on, or um, grafted on guardian rootstock. And you can see her row spacing there. This was done at two different locations in the state of North Carolina. All right, and what she observed, so we'll go ahead and move on to yield. Again, this is reported in thousands of kilograms per hectare, which would be roughly equivalent to thousands of pounds per acre. The, um, the, the different widths are on this x-axis here. So you can see a couple of things. One is that the top line here is the irrigated plots. And they, across each strip width in this location, yielded more than the non-irrigated plots. So the other thing that you'll notice is that for both irrigated and non-irrigated, there was a bump between the 10 foot strip and the 12 foot strip. So this would be for the non-irrigated here. The same trend was observed for the irrigated. And what Juliana came out with is that if a grower is used to having a 10 foot strip and not irrigating, they could get essentially an equivalent yield by irrigating and having a four foot strip. So there's an interaction of uh, irrigation and, and strip width going on here. At the second location, which was a sandier soil um, at, at Clayton, North Carolina, she observed the opposite. So in this case, the irrigated plots actually yielded less than the non-irrigated plots. So the non-irrigated plots yielded more. The trend of 12-foot strips yielding more than 10-foot strips, though, was consistent, again, across the irrigated as well as the non-irrigated plots. Now, the reason that there was, in this case, more yield with non-irrigated plots is because we believe that um, some of the nitrogen was being leached out of the soil with our irrigation events. And so what happened was, um, you know, chlorophyll, nitrogen was measured with a SPAD meter and it was less in irrigated trees versus non-irrigated trees. Leaf size after bud break was smaller in irrigated trees than non-irrigated. The color of leaves was lighter in irrigated trees versus non-irrigated. Another interesting thing is that irrigated trees um, tended to lose their leaves earlier as well. And we'll show you what that looks like. So here's a shot of that up close and then kind of an aerial view. And you can make out the block of trees that had irrigation um, because the leaves are starting to drop sooner. You can also make out um, some of the different strips that were used in this study. All right, so a couple of takeaways from the blackberry and, and peach strip with work. Um, weed free strip is not static. Um, so, you know, it's not one of those things that we necessarily want to set and forget. We can see benefits um, and disadvantages based on manipulating that um, over time. Recommendations will vary by how established the crop is. Maybe we can get away with uh, less of a, a strip width. Uh, during the establishment phase because our crop roots haven't gotten out uh, as, as far wide into the row middles. 
Um, rominal species will also play a role. Soil type, irrigation, and crop fertility are interactive with our strip widths. And um, let's see what else. Oh, so the other thing that's important that when we tell a lot of growers about how we can see increased yield by increasing strip width beyond what they typically use um, is, is cases where there may be a slope to the field and increasing strip width may result in increased risk of erosion. So that's something be, to be mindful of. Um, some of the other resistance we get when we talk about increasing strip width is based on uh, the equipment that a particular grower may have. So, um, you know, you may have uh, your field set up a certain way because your, if it's your equipment labor, um, some folks have wider strips than are necessary because they have laborers that are hand picking crops in the early morning and they don't want to get dew on their shoes. So they'll make the, the strip a little bit wider to prevent their laborers from walking on, on wet grass. So a lot of different things going on here. All right, the other thing to think about, so that was the part about you know, where a weed becomes a weed. The other aspect of this is, is when do we control weeds? Now for most crops, we have this concept of critical period for weed control. And we talked about that a little bit with the peach example. If we can keep them weed free in the first nine to 12 weeks after flowering, that's ideal. For vegetable crops, this is pretty straightforward. It's usually two to six weeks after planting or transplanting, but it's a little bit different for our fruit crops. One example that I'll give you, and this is, I apologize for this, this is a, an annual plastic culture strawberry example, because that's what I've done my work in. I need to get in some matted row stuff, I know. Um, but this is kind of the growth uh, cycle of strawberries and annual plastic cultures. So they're typically planted in October and then harvested the following uh, spring and summer. But in this system, the critical time for weed control is really from planting until January to February. And that is really because it coincides with, with this establishment phase. So for, if you think about a matted row strawberry, we would really want to be focusing our um, critical period for weed control efforts right as a kind of breaking dormancy and, and getting started into the season. Another thing to think about is the timing of weed control during crop establishment. So this is an example from wine grape that was reported by Wayne Mitchum. And what you can see is they maintain the herbicide strip uh, weed free for zero weeks after planting wine grape um, vines. So that would mean that they, they didn't use any weed control for the entire se first season. Uh, the first four weeks after planting, eight, 12, 16, 20, and 24 weeks after planting, and the data that you see on the screen is the vine cross-sectional area. So what you're seeing essentially is that between zero and about 12 weeks, if we can keep these new vines weed-free, we can maximize our growth in that first year. And if, if you don't believe the graph, here's some visual evidence for you. So this would be the, the, the vines that had zero weeks weed-free, four weeks weed-free, uh, eight weeks weed free, and then of course the 12 week with that nice uh, lush plant right there. All right, another aspect of weed management that we have to talk about is just being able to recognize what you're up against, being able to identify weeds. And of course, your county extension um, educators may be able to help you out with this. I know there's a number of apps that can also maybe get you in the ballpark. I am still pretty old school, so I rely on a good book full of color photographs. And so two that I recommend are on the screen, but there are plenty others. It's important to know what weeds uh, we have so that we know how to control them. Um, at, at least if we can get into some kind of category, is it a grass, is it a broadleaf, is it a sedge, uh, is it an annual, perennial, biennial, uh, some kind of information to, to help us in our management practices. Another thing we wanna do is scout. And I heard uh, Dr. Long talk about scouting um, one, so you know what you have, but also to know if your treatments were effective. And I don't know that we got a lot of information about scouting in Indiana, but again, work done by a colleague of mine in a different state reported that 40% of blueberry growers scout their fields once a week, 35% um, scouted less than once a month, and then eight didn't scout at all. And we know that scouting is important because scouting and implementing our practices uh, pest management practices on that scouting 
help us to increase our control and return uh, on our investment. All right, to give you an example of this, this is uh, some data from a blueberry uh, block um, from my time again in North Carolina. I apologize, I keep going back to my grad school days with these examples, but essentially what you'll see is uh, the rows are, are basically up and down. I walked down one row, that would be sample one, came back down another row, got sample two and three, uh, went back down a, a third row to get sample four. And I would throw out this um, one square foot um, quadrat in, in a representative area in that row and count the number of weeds. And so if you were to just take uh, and walk down this row one, look at a representation of the weeds in that row, you might think that you have no weed problem at all. If you were to just walk down this third row that I walked down and find a representative one foot square, uh, you might realize or think that you just have a grass problem and maybe a graminicide would be all you need to clean it up. If you walk down this row, you'd see maybe a better picture of, of what you have. So we have some broadleaf weeds, some grasses, even some trees starting to creep in, um, and, then, and then vining crops as well as green briar or smilax. The important thing to be aware of in our perennial fruit crops is that the more we scout, the better, because a lot of the times the weeds that we see across the, the field or the blocks or however you have your, your production partitioned um, is not going to be uniform. So just being aware that you, you'll have some differences across your, your site. All right, moving on to, to actually managing weeds. We have a lot of different things we can use, cultural, mechanical, um, biological, which we won't really talk about much today. And then we'll touch on some of the chemical stuff as well. All right, the first thing that I like to recommend is sanitation and exclusion because prevention is the best cure. The example on the screen is a sweet potato example. It's a harvester, but it, it's full of yellow nut sedge uh, shoots and tubers and roots, which if you, you know, move that through a field, it's going to then distribute that weed uh, across an entire field. In um, perennial fruit crops, we might think of something like a, a mower that's used to mow row minnows. So if we mow a, a particularly weedy patch of row middle and drop seeds on top of the mower deck, and then we go to another patch um, or, or plot or a block, whatever we're calling these uh, different fields, go to another field, um, before you clean that deck off, you could be moving the weed seed to another part of your field. So just be mindful that equipment is a really good way to move weed seeds um, across fields and, and even great distances. Just like the lantern fly, I guess I got going. All right, so let's see. Another thing we wanna do with regards to sanitation and exclusion is be mindful of the things that we bring onto our farm. So if you're using seeds, whether they're um, for row metals or, or some other use, be sure that they come from a reputable source and are mostly weed free. Um, it's hard to get anything that's completely weed free, but mostly weed free is good. Um, we can also get weeds on farm through things like hay and straw, and then windborne seed can be spread from fence rows, field edges, and ditches. And I say windborne seed, but that, that could even be things like maples. Um, uh, fruits that have, uh, trees that have those samaras or helicopter type fruits, they actually, you know, come into a, a perennial fruit field from a pretty great distance. We uh, can use cultural controls. Um, I'm most familiar with using these in vegetable crops, but perhaps some of this can be adapted for perennial fruits as well. Things like in-row and between-row plant spacing, planting date, cultivar selection, crop rotation, and then ensuring that our crop has everything that it needs to, to grow vigorously. Some examples of this, and I apologize, this is a vegetable example, but I think it illustrates the point pretty well. Uh, these are two different spinaches, two different spinach varieties growing in the high tunnel at the Purdue student farm. So if you look at the left photo in the foreground, that is one type of spinach in the background is a different one. And then those two uh, types of spinach are also uh, on the right photo there too. You can, you can clearly see that they have a different kind of architecture to the shoot tissues. And this is what it looks like from overhead. So if, you, if we just disregard the fact that the woodpecker variety also seem to have poor germination, um, we can see that the growth habit of flamingo is more competitive than woodpecker and will help us with our weed management program more than, than woodpecker would. 
We can use mulches as well. So polyethylene mulch is fairly common in vegetable production. We'll show you some examples of what it looks like in, in fruit production systems as well. We can use carbon-based mulches, whether that's straw or hay or tree bark uh, and landscape fabric can be used and we'll show you some examples of that. One thing to be mindful of is that sometimes these carbon-based mulches can also be host or provide uh, habitat or protection for some of our uh, insect or non-vertebrate pests. So um, the example on the screen is broccoli and the photo on the left had mulch, which provided habitat for slugs that would come out at dusk and feed on the leaves. The photo on the right didn't have uh, straw mulch around it, no habitat for the slugs and no real injury to speak of. If we look at a fruit example, I've seen something similar with strawberries and, and straw um, providing habitat for crickets, which would then go onto the developing strawberry fruit and feed on the seed and result in misshapen strawberry fruit that were then not marketable. So there's, there are some fruit examples of this as well. Looking at black plastic mulch, it's, uh, it's good at weed suppression because it blocks sunlight, which prevents germination of seeds that require sunlight. And then um, most plants, if they do germinate below it, can't actually penetrate it. And so they run out of resources. Like I said, we think of this most often with vegetable production systems, but it has been used in some perennial fruit crops as well. This is uh, blueberries growing on black plastic mulch. And what you wanna do if you intend to use mulch in this way is to not skimp on the mulch. Get, get a nice thick mulch that hopefully will not tear and will hopefully give you two or three years of, uh, of, of mostly staying intact so that you can, you can get the most out of it and get that crop growing um, and established before that mulch deteriorates. Of course, if you can keep the deer and the raccoons off of it, that is also very helpful. Here's an example from blackberry. So in this case, the growers use black plastic mulch right in the very center of the row metal. And then he has landscape fabric stapled on the shoulders of the row. And the reason for this is that if he had landscape fabric across the entire row, it wouldn't allow for the primocanes of these blackberries to actually emerge each year. Um, so that's what, what the photo on the screen is showing, the, the primocanes popping up through that black plastic mulch there. One thing to, to note again is that it won't last forever. And so eventually that black, black, black plastic mulch will deteriorate or break down or be torn and, and, and go away. And you will start to see weeds uh, coming into that system. These two are, are dog fennel and looks like yellow nut sedge there coming in. Now, this is uh, black plastic mulch in strawberry. And one of the things to be mindful of, again, if you're gonna plant on black plastic mulch or, or really any kind of plastic or polyethylene mulch is to not make that planting hole any larger than we need to because the larger the hole, the more option or the more, the more um, ability for weeds to grow through the plastic. If you have to fix, uh, in this case, a leaky drip tape, you wanna make as small of an incision into the uh, black plastic as you can, again, so as not to allow for large areas for weeds to break through. And if you have to put a huge hole in a, in a plastic like this, um, if you can try to duct tape it or, or patch it some way so you don't have to let the weeds pop through. Uh, just a photo of what it looks like when it's done right. This is out of Plant City, Florida. If you look at the um, the hole here, the drip tape comes out. You can see there's hardly, it's just big enough for that drip tape to come out. So we're not making a whole lot of extra space for weeds to be able to grow through this black plastic. One weed that doesn't really care if you have black plastic or not is yellow nut sedge. And luckily enough, I haven't heard as much about this here in Indiana as I have in other places I've worked. It's a perennial weed and it has these really pointy leaf tips, which can actually pierce through black plastic mulch, in this case, uh, strawberry production system, and it can grow through cantaloupe. This is a photo from Wayne Mitchum again. Um, and, and there's what it looks like popping through the center of that cantaloupe fruit. Um, I've even seen it grow through uh, sweet potatoes, which are really hard. So this is, is one weed that doesn't care if you have black plastic mulch down or not. All right, we'll move on to the herbicide updates. These slides are gonna be taken verbatim from my colleague at the University of Kentucky, Sean Wright. 
And in particular, he's really trying to draw uh, attention to the changes that were made to the 2021 to 2022 Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. So we'll just go through these as they are. All right, in general, um, the generic herbicide table was expanded. So you can save a good bit of money by using generics compared to using name brand products. Just be aware of, read the label. That's, that's the key here. A lot of times generic labels are not as expansive as, uh, as name brand labels. And so you just need to be mindful that the use you intend to use the product for is actually on the label. Looking at apple and pear, goaltender was added to uh, apple and pear section, both pre and post. And then gramoxone was added for sucker control. Uh, if you intend to use gramoxone for sucker control, Sean points out that um, if it's used during harvest, all the dropped fruit must be picked up before using it. Uh, we, don't, we just don't want to get paraquat on any dropped fruit um, that, are, that are on the floor there. There's also uh, tighter use requirements, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Post-emergence, Rely 280, which is glufosinate now, requires 14 days between applications, and the maximum rate is based on calendar year. Uh, some of the language on these labels was a little ambiguous. It would say year, uh, but not, you know, specifies if that was crop year or calendar year. So um, we now have this down as calendar year. Uh, select max can be used in, in bearing uh, palm fruits now. So it controls annual bluegrass. Um, it's better on perennial grasses, uh, but he says post here in this case is better on crabgrass. Venue is also available now for, for use on suckers. Um, on immature growth, but avoid contact with green bark. It is uh, non-selective in a burner, so if you get it on green bark, it'll cause injury. Changes in stone fruit, again, goaltender added to the, the pre and post sections, 2,4-D amine added for non-bearing trees, but they must be established for a year, and then gramoxone was added as well. Post, uh, again, select max was added to the bearing uh, stone fruit section. For the longest time, it was just labeled for non-bearing trees, but now it can be used in bearing trees. Venue added to the annual and perennial broadleaf weed control post-emergence section as well. All right, now on non-bearing trees, uh, Fusilade is limited to three applications per year rather than three per season, and it has a 14-day um, time frame between applications, between treatments. And then Reglone, which is Diquat, uh, added the required use of a non-ionic surfactant at 0.5% volume to volume and has a one year pre-harvest interval. So you, you can apply that within one year of harvest. As far as grape goes, again, gold tender was added and um, for annual broadleaf control and grass suppression, dormant applications only and on vines that are established for at least three years, unless all the vines on the trellis uh, wire are at a minimum height of three feet. As far as post-emergence goes, again, fusillade, maximum of three applications per year instead of per season. Goaltender was added, and then Rely 280 language was, was changed as well. For blueberry, Chateau um, was added for control of annual broadleaves and suppression of grass. Sean has this listed as a, as a post product, but I, I, you know, it, it is a PPO, so it will provide um, some post emergence, basically burning of green weedy plant tissue, but it also has really good pre-emergence activity. So it may fit better, in my opinion, as a pre, even though we've got it listed as a post right here. The Li-280, again, do not make more than two applications at a maximum uh, rate of 82 fluid ounces per acre per year. As far as the bramble changes go, Chateau is no longer on the supplemental label. It's actually been moved to the, the section three of the national label. Uh, AIM-2 EW is no longer registered, only the EC formulation. And then with strawberries, Sinbar is now a wettable dry granule instead of a wettable powder. And I had a chance to use this last Friday. Um, opened a, Even though I saw the WDG on the bag, I opened it expecting it to be powder. And if you've ever used a Sinbar powder, um, or powders in general, it's just it's tough. But uh, so the WG formulation is, is a lot easier to, to measure and, uh, and to handle. So that's a good thing. 
Um, if you've got cold water, though, it, it takes quite a bit of shaking or agitation to get it into suspension. We mentioned new paraquat requirements. So if you use paraquat, so things like Gramoxone, Devour, Cyclone, Quickquat, there's a number of different uh, product, products labeled that are paraquat. There are some additional labeling requirements. It now requires um, that you be certified to apply it. So you, you can't just be working under, under the direction of someone who is certified. You have to be certified yourself. Um, specialized approved paraquat training is also required for anyone who will mix, load, apply, or handle the paraquat. And we'll talk about that training on the next slide. And then there's new closed system packaging as well that's supposed to be um, appearing this year. So if you are going to mix, load, handle, spray, um, touch a jug of paraquat in any way, there's this new paraquat video. It's a 30 minute video, uh, actually pretty well put together, a good refresher on pesticide handling in general. After watching the 30 minute video, there's a 15 question quiz, which you need to answer all 15 questions correctly. Um, in full disclosure, it took me three tries to, uh, to get all 15 questions correct. Um, so just read the questions carefully. The good news is if you don't get all 15 right the first time, you can take the quiz again immediately. Another good thing is that the training lasts for three years. So you don't have to do this every year, um, even though it's not, not terribly cumbersome. Looking at some of the examples of the, the closed transfer system, this is one that I've seen. Um, if you look at the left photo, there is this uh, dust cap, essentially that is removed and it reveals this plus sign plug. That fits in to this port that would go on your spray tank. Um, and so you would put the jug in there, you turn it clockwise to start the flow. The more clockwise you turn it, the quicker the product flows from the jug. Uh, there are these measurement marks in both in the upright and in the upside down position so you can monitor how much product is going into the tank. And the reason for all this is because over the last several years, um, I think we're up to maybe more than 30 individuals now have have died from ingesting paraquat that was placed into drink containers. And one sip of paraquat is lethal. And so EPA has made these changes to try to avoid um, more of that scenario. All right, we're, we're coming in the home stretch here, I promise you. Uh, one of the things you need to be aware of is that over the top formulations of dicamba have been extended for another five years by the EPA. So we might just want to be mindful of what some of the symptomology looks like. And I'm going to give you an example of that with grape. So dicamba injury on grape can result in, um, so we're looking at drift rates here, elongated growth, upward leaf cupping, and fewer berries per cluster. And you can see some of those photos from uh, Bruce Bordelon on the screen here. Purdue does have an extension pub if you want to learn more about, about this. Um, if you look at 2,4-D, there's a really, um, you know, the photo on the right is really typical of what we see when grape is exposed to 2,4-D injury. Um, so shoot tip death, especially at higher rates, lateral shoot growth as a result of the shoot tip uh, being, being killed, leaf strapping, which is documented in the photo on the right, fewer berries per cluster. And what we tend to think is that there are differences in sensitivity by variety. So uh, vinifera being more sensitive than French hybrids, which are more sensitive than American grapes. However, American grapes um, can be really useful for uh, indicating drift, especially if, if you have them growing up trees at, at a wood edge or a field edge or a ditch or something like that. Um, they can help indicate whether we've had a drift event in our field. Just to give you an example, dicamba is that upward leaf cupping and then 2,4-D is that, that leaf strapping or elongated leaf margin appearance. I encourage you, of course, to register your sensitive crops on Driftwatch. Um, the photo of this was, this was taken about a year and a half ago, but you can see all the different types of, of crops that are documented. If we zoom in close to the West Lafayette area, you can see a number of different uh, fields that have been registered. So applicators of these over-the-top dicamba formulations are supposed to go to a site like Driftwatch or Fieldwatch and uh, make sure that there aren't sensitive crops in the area prior to applying these herbicides. So that's the benefit of having your, your fields registered. 
There are a new set of fact sheets available through the North Central IPM Center about drift and particularly auxinic herbicide drift to specialty crops. So I encourage you to check these out. There's also a survey by the North Central IPM Center as well and our colleagues at Ohio State and here at Purdue are collaborating on this. So we would encourage you to follow the link on the screen here that go.osu.edu uh, backslash drift 10 and fill out that survey. It's uh, pretty painless. Even if you haven't had drift, we wanna hear from you. Um, so we know how rampant we, uh, you know, how, how, how widespread this problem is or isn't. All right, there's some references, which were mostly put up on the screen for the recording. If you wanna go back or you can take a photo if you wanna go uh, learn more about some of the research that was reported in this presentation. And there's my contact information. Again, you could uh, screenshot that or, or take a photo. Um, and you can, you can always Google me. But uh, there's my email, my office phone, and my Twitter handle. And I, I see uh, some flashing on my screen, so I'm guessing we have questions, and I hope that I'm answering <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Well, thank you for that update. Um, really appreciate all the information you were able to provide. We do have um, some questions in the in the chat here. So the first one was, do, do you have any, uh, so growing degree day phenologies developed towards um, specific weeds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not aware of them. I know there are though, and, and that's mostly like uh, Dr. Long alluded to with, uh, with her talk. A lot of that is going to be based on soil temperature. So um, I don't know if, I mean, if there's a particular weed, but um, I don't know the, the right way to answer that. But we do know that there are certain weeds that are germinating right now, for example, right? And there are some that have pretty tight emergence windows, maybe over you know two or four weeks. And there are others that will start germinating now and, and germinate throughout the summer and, you know, so uh, it kind of depends on the weed, I guess, that we're, we're looking at. Um, right. She mentions giant ragweed and water hemp. Um, so those may have like specific temperatures that they'll germinate in, but um, I know uh, those will typically continue germinating throughout the, the spring. So yeah. And giant ragweed is one of those that pops up pretty early in, in the spring. And I, I, I don't know exactly, but I'd say, I mean, sometime in April, we should start to see giant ragweed emerging, depending on, of course, Indiana is a, a tall state north to south. So uh, I'm assuming that this, this person is in Indiana, but it is one that can germinate in fairly um, cool soils. And it, it may not germinate later into the summer months, but, but yeah, it's one that, that can kind of establish early. Um, water hemp is going to come on later but water hemp can germinate all summer long. And that's one of the issues with water hemp is that, you know, if we, if we let up and allow some of it to escape, um, you know, those late emerging water hemp will still set seed that we have to contend with in, in future years. And they can- Yeah, those, those pigweed species, I know I've seen them germinate in August and they're flowering and setting seed by September. So- uh, So, I mean, it's interesting. Well. Yeah, so they, they won't they won't get to be the six foot tall giants or something that is really emerging one. But yeah, they, they may just they may just be a few inches tall, but by darn, you know by darn they're gonna they're gonna set some seed and make sure that you've got something to deal with next year. Yeah, of course. So weeds will keep us on our toes. Uh, the next That's question job is security, <laughs> so sure is. So the next question is um, it says. They used uh, torched an organic spray in their orchard, at least listed organic, um, worked very well among essential oil-based agents. Um, do you, have you familiar with torched or um, used it? I'm not familiar with that product. I wonder if, if uh, they could tell me what the active is. I know a, a lot of the OMRI listed, so I guess there's a couple things to note. One is, is always to check with your certifier, if you're certified organic, to make sure that, that what you plan to spray um, will not get you in trouble because there are things that are organic but, but may not be OMRI labeled or OMRI approved. Um, most of the organic herbicides are um, either oils or acids that are naturally occurring. And for the most part, they're contact, meaning that they don't 
typically move throughout the weed um, and uh, generally non-selective. So uh, we want to keep them off our crop as well. So those are just some really general, without knowing the particular active ingredient in that product, those are some general guidelines. Um, and then they also just shared um, a method that they've used with their trees is uh, planting into the landscaping fabric and then um, having some pea gravel at the base of those trees. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think that's, that's a good idea, yeah. And then does the, the Midwest Guide provide test results on impacts to wildlife pollinators for those agents in addition to the efficacy against weeds? Oh, that is a good question. I don't know, I, I feel like the, the Midwest Veg Guide does. Jana may know, I think she's on here, and, and Dr. Uh, Elizabeth may know as well. Um, so Elizabeth has commented, um, so they are working on incorporating pollinator and predatory mite risk levels for insecticides and fungicides um, on the future updates for the pest, the fruit pest management guide. So yeah, they're working yeah. on trying to include that information. Um, any outcome, uh, is there any outcome research uh, comparing simple mechanical weeding versus herbicides under tree fruits? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't, I just don't, I don't know how much mechanical weed management is done once the crops are established. I don't, I don't see a lot of that. Um, and, and someone on this call may know more about that than I do. Um, I, I know there are other tactics being explored, things like steam, uh, abrasives, you know, non chemical um, methods, but I don't know about cultivation in the row once the, the perennial fruits are actually established. So it looks like maybe maybe you're getting some uh, recommendations for your future research projects here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some, you know, some <laughs> crops, you know, if we think about like blueberry, for example, right, they have a really sensitive root system that we typically don't want to disturb. You know, no root, what is it, no root hairs or something, right? So, so we, you know, we want to be mindful of that and, and not, yeah. Um, and then there was one other question, but it looks like maybe this is for uh, Director Elizabeth, if she's still available. And then we'll go back to, so we, we want to maximize impact of herbicide, minimize volume of herbicides used, um, thus knowing what stage to spray is helpful. And so I think that's, that was, um, Melanie, who was talking about the growing degree days. So uh, okay. I know that yeah. there, there's a paper that Purdue has on the crabgrass, right? So the emergence of crabgrass throughout Indiana and when to put that pre-emergent on. So maybe that's, um, I don't think, I'm not aware of anything like that for other weeds, but maybe you are. No, and that, and that makes sense. Yeah, if we, if we can target smaller weeds, generally we, we can, you know, have more efficacy with our herbicides and we can generally use a lower rate, which helps us um, on the crop safety end as well. So yeah, that's useful information for sure. Well, I'll go ahead and launch the last poll if you are ready for that. Um, all right, well, thank you again for everyone that was joined us today for our fruit webinar series. We look forward to seeing you next week at the same time, Tuesday, one to 3 p.m. Um, Eastern time and if you have any questions in the meantime, please reach out to any one of us and we will help get you get you the answers and get you in the right direction. So thank you again.